It's terrific to see so many people in the in the virtual audience, although I know you can't see each other, but trust you are in good in good company. I'm very excited for this, this session today and it's really great to have you with us. All right, so let's kick things off. Um, Hopefully you can all hear me. Welcome to session three, room three. Uh, this is a session on the policies and politics of planning for sea level rise. I'm Liz Kozlov. I'm an assistant professor here at uh, UCLA where I teach classes on sea level rise and social response and on environmental justice. Um, to start, let me just you know note that you know we're living in a time of so many so many crises, and I want to open this panel by recognizing their interconnectedness and also the groups and movements that are working in many different capacities to address them. Um, as we you know, go on in this session to discuss the future of coastal land use, I want to acknowledge UCLA's presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrieleno Tongva peoples, the traditional caretakers of the lands of the Los Angeles Basin and Southern Channel Islands. And as we note, the need to, to mitigate as well as adapt to climate change by divesting from fossil fuels and investing in non-extractive ways of life in a city, Los Angeles, where the history of environmental justice organizing is very deeply connected to the movement for prison abolition. I wanna recognize the ongoing efforts of UCLA students, faculty, staff, and workers to ensure divestment from policing at the University of California and acknowledge that such policing disproportionately violates black, brown, indigenous, queer, trans, and poor peoples, uh, those who are also disproportionately harmed by climate change and whose leadership on climate action reminds us that we cannot successfully and sustainably adapt to any one crisis or impact in isolation. Uh, so I'm thrilled to learn today from our panelists' expansive understanding of the complexities, the challenges, and the transformative potential of adaptation in the context of sea level rise. And let me first thank the, the many collaborators who made this day possible. And I'll also share a few tips for using this webinar platform. Uh, so you should be able from your view to drag around and minimize and resize any of the windows. Um, and you can click the buttons that you see at the bottom in order to view the presenter's full bios and the abstracts of their presentations. Um, you can also use those buttons to submit a question. Uh, so time permitting, we'll address these questions at the end. We do have a very packed session, so we're gonna see how it goes, but I hope we'll have time for at least a couple of questions. So please feel free to keep submitting those as we go along through the presentations. All right, so our first speaker that we have up here, are our illustrious speakers. Our first speech, speaker is Rachel Ehlers, Principal Fiscal and Policy Analyst with the California Legislative Analysts Office. And I will introduce each of the other speakers in turn before they present. So Rachel, let me turn it over to you. Thank you. Great. Um, thanks so much, Liz, and I'm really excited and happy to be here. Uh, I'll be talking today about a report that my office, the California Legislative Analysts Office, put out in December of 2019 called Preparing for Rising Seas and it, uh, how the state can help support local coastal adaptation efforts in California. So first, just a little bit about uh, my office. We are the nonpartisan advisors to the state legislature in California. We provide independent nonpartisan uh, policy analysis, advice, recommendations, and that includes uh, independent reports sometimes on, on specific topics for the legislature and for the public. So that's what this report was. It was really, we undertook it in response to kind of an evolving conversation in Sacramento, uh, moving beyond just climate mitigation efforts uh, in which the state's been engaged for many years really to start talking about adaptation and what are we gonna do about the impacts that we know are, are coming. So the focus of the report is really what can the state do and specifically what can the legislature do to support efforts at the local level. Uh, we talked to over 100 interviewees, state government, local government, federal government, uh, stakeholders, academic researchers, and also relied upon the research that is available, including some statewide surveys that have been undertaken of uh, coastal adaptation professionals that were really helpful. So I'll talk briefly just about sea level rise in California, knowing that we have an audience that's from all over the country and world. 
then about some of our findings uh, on challenges for local uh, climate adaptation, our recommendations for what the legislature and state could maybe do about some of those challenges, and then conclude with some updates of what's happened since the report was published. So just starting with some background, uh, based on guidance that the state has put out for locals in 2018 on sea level rise, uh, we're expecting about a foot off the coast of California by 2030 and up to seven feet uh, by 2100. So this um, figure here shows some of the different ranges in different areas of California, San Francisco in red, Los Angeles in orange, but you can see they're all in the same ballpark. Um, and that there is greater uncertainty as time goes on, but uh, pretty high order of magnitude. And of course, these estimates don't take into account storms, uh, high tides, El Nino events that will uh, raise water levels even further on an episodic level. So this will have pretty big impacts on our state. Um, this picture is of San Francisco Bay. It's uh, You probably can't see it in detail, but you probably do notice a lot of are blue, and that's flooding. This is a scenario of two feet of sea level rise with a 10-year storm. So that's a storm that may in every 10 years. So very um, likely scenario over the coming decades. And you can see a lot of uh, deep water flooding. In the bottom left there, that's Silicon Valley, the city of Foster, the uh, city that is completely underwater. Um, the pullout figure on the right in the dark blue shows the Oakland International Airport underwater. So big impacts, some studies have found or uh, estimated between eight and $10 billion of property along the California coast underwater uh, by 2050, and also impacts on our natural resources. Some other research has found uh, estimated that with six feet of sea level rise, two thirds of the beaches in Southern California could be underwater. It's really iconic beaches. And, and it's not just property, it's not just natural resources, it's not just mansions on the coast, it's also uh, public infrastructure and uh, really vulnerable communities as well. So most of the responsibility for responding to this does lie at the local government level. That's where most of the land use decisions are made and uh, where most of the public infrastructure is owned by local government, not by the state. But that doesn't mean the state doesn't have an important role in helping make sure that our state is well prepared to um, address some of these impacts. So there are a lot of benefits for taking action sooner, even though some of these impacts do feel far off in the future, perhaps. It can allow us to be more strategic and phased in some of the uh, adaptation actions we're taking. It gives us time to research and test out approaches of what might work and what might not. This is new stuff for all of us, so uh, we need some time to um, see what might be most effective before the water is at our doorstep. We can also spread out costs. And there is a lot of research that suggests the, key decade, uh, the coming decade is a really key time period, especially to put some of the natural solutions in place before the water gets higher, give wetlands time to build up and for the sediment to accrete before the water is higher. And that if we don't act soon, we'll lose those options. So in looking at the state of preparedness around California, uh, we do find that many jurisdictions are starting to do this work. They're doing vulnerability assessments, starting to develop adaptation plans, um, maybe starting to put some kind of detailed plans in place, but very few have progressed to implementing projects. One of those statewide surveys found that only 16% of the coastal community respondents had moved into the implementation phase of projects. So really just in the early stages at this point. So if we know that the impacts are gonna be really serious and we know that acting soon gives a lot of benefits, why is it that we're still in the early stages? So our research found six key challenges that are inhibiting progress at the local level. Um, and the first shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, it's funding. <laughs> funding constrains, constrains both planning and projects. Uh, and this research was undertaken before the, the COVID pandemic hit. So you can imagine that those constraints are even more pressing at this point. 
The second big challenge we heard about was capacity limitations at the local government. So that is also related to funding. They don't have a budget to hire an adaptation staff. Uh, so everyone who's working there has multiple hats and this is just yet another hat they have to fit into their responsibilities, but also capacity of knowledge that even if they do have a budget to hire an adaptation specialist, there aren't that many around. There's really a, a lack of capacity across the state and nation and finding experts to, to hire to come in to be part of the staff at local government and work on this. Uh, also, that leads to the third challenge, which is a lack of key information. And this was interesting. We didn't hear so much that um, local governments were missing like flood maps or flood scenarios or where's the water going to come. They felt like they had resources in that area. It's really more then what do I do about it? What are the options? How much do they cost? Who can I talk to? And who else has done this work? Um, that, that is the key information that's really lacking at this point. The fourth big challenge was uh, forums for talking about these issues, sharing information, and planning and implementing projects across jurisdictions. The water does not uh, respect city uh, government lines. And so it's really going to be vital to do some planning and undertake responses across jurisdictions. But we just don't at this point have a forum set up for that kind of information sharing and decision making. Um, the fifth big challenge is that this isn't a priority yet. And again, this was even before public health became uh, uh, number one priority. Even then, this wasn't the highest priority uh, constituents, and therefore their local, local officials were really worried about potholes and schools and housing and jobs. And uh, this really felt really far off in the future and not something they were interested in uh, prioritizing yet. And then the final big challenge we heard about was uh, attaining project permits, that the process is just really long. We have a very robust regulatory system along the coast of California with both state and federal requirements that was set up to protect against um, overdevelopment of the coast. But implementing a natural shoreline project is not the same as building a big hotel, but yet our regulatory system is set up the same way for both types of projects. So really haven't had an evolution yet of how to approach these new types of response adaptation projects in order to move them quickly um, and get some of these projects underway. So what are we recommending that our bosses do about it? Uh, we have four categories of recommendations, each with three specific uh, recommendations underneath. So I'll move through them pretty quickly. Um, the first category is fostering regional scale adaptation. We think this is a great role for the state to play to help set up some of those partnerships specifically uh, providing some funding, incentive funding for forming those groups across counties, uh, providing some money for facilitators, for sharing information, for developing plans that really address regional impacts, and then for uh, undertaking some of the work, putting some of the projects in place. The second category is supporting local planning and adaptation projects. So even if we get this regional system in place, individual cities, and counties are going to need to, to work on their own projects for their own more localized impacts. And so we think the state has an important role to play there. Uh, in particular, providing funding for some uh, demonstration projects and pilot projects to test out strategies and see what works. Uh, and also focusing on some other really key public benefits like uh, protecting natural resources and uh, supporting more vulnerable communities that may not have the resources and capacity to do this work on their own. The third big category is providing information, assistance, and support. And one key recommendation here is setting up, we recommend setting up a climate adaptation center and regional support network to be resources for local governments. We heard over and over again, you know, it's great. We got a website with a lot of information. We just need someone we can call. We need someone we can talk to about our specific issue who can help us figure out what to do, who can connect us to others who may have ideas, who've tried this, who can come to our city council meetings with us and help walk our, our council through what the problems and, and options are. So really providing that kind of resource. We think that's a really uh, great role that the state can play to help support local governments. Uh, the next category is enhancing public awareness of sea level rise risks and impacts. Again, this was a big challenge we heard at the local government level that the um, Californians just don't quite understand that this is a problem that they should be worrying about, and therefore their elected officials are, are not having this as their highest priority either. Uh, one of the key recommendations we had here 
is recommending the legislature require coastal flooding disclosures for real estate transactions. So here in California, we do have laws that require those kinds of disclosures for uh, areas of high risk of wildfire, uh, earthquake, and uh, historical flooding, like riverine flooding, but not yet for coastal. We think that that is a very comparable public policy goal, would really help expand public awareness, but also for these purchases that are often the biggest purchase that a family will make of a house, what, understanding what their risks are um, and, and what they're undertaking uh, makes a lot of sense. So since we put this report out in December, um, a few things have changed. <laughs> we had a lot of in interest and uh, uh, momentum in this in January and February, a lot of media coverage on the topic and a lot of activity in our state legislature here in California. There were oversight hearings. Um, there were several members that proposed legislation. There was a lot of talk about a climate resilience bond, general obligation bond going on the ballot in November for voters to be able to approve funding for some of these projects, proposal from both uh, the governor and within both houses of the legislature. Uh, and then a lot of activity at the state agency level as well, um, uh, increased coordination across ag different agencies, strategic planning, a really big regional planning effort starting to get underway in the San Francisco Bay Area called Bay Adapt led by one of our state agencies, uh, and then the world changed. <laughs> so in this new reality, uh, I think one of the biggest barriers will be reduced revenues, both at the state level as well as at the local levels. Uh, those legislative proposals and bond uh, discussion did not move forward in the session, um, legislative session that ended this summer. And if we thought there were competing priorities before, uh, that has become an even bigger challenge at the local government level uh, in terms of funding, but also capacity of staff. So I think, you know, this is just going to mean that we're going to need to be increasingly creative and efficient when we're undertaking projects like rehabbing a water treatment plant along the coast. We can't just do it, uh, address what its needs are now. We need to build adaptation into that project um, and look for ways to be kind of efficient and more coordinated in our efforts um, because we just don't have the funding capacity or time to treat um, adaptations separately from other business as usual um, upgrades. Uh, it also is a good time to continue to do planning and build partnerships, build collaboration, talk about what's needed. That is not as expensive as undertaking the big project. So if we're more limited in funding right now, now's the perfect time to start getting those plans and work in place so that as the economy recovers in the coming years, we're ready to go with the projects and we've done the work that really needs to be done uh, before we, we put shovels in the ground anyway. So uh, I can end here today the same way that we ended our report, which is that even if the legislature were to adopt all of our recommendations, we wouldn't be done. There's still additional work to be done, um, issues that we didn't touch on, legal questions are a big one that came up over and over again in our interviews, questions about what is a takings and uh, what is the responsibility of the local government to protect or not. Uh, we think the state really needs to decide what the state's role is going to be in setting um, parameters around what gets protected and what maybe doesn't, um, because we're not going to be able to protect everything. Thinking about where we're building this issue of insurance markets is really big in California right now in the fire zone. We're seeing insurance companies pull out of certain areas where they think it's too risky to insure properties. That will happen along the coast at some point. So getting ahead of that and planning for how we're going to handle that. Um, and then, of course, sea level rise isn't the only climate-related risk and challenge. This is just what we focused on in this report. Um, <clears throat> so more work to be done, but we do think there's an important role for the state. While this has been a California-focused uh, report, I think a lot of the lessons and the idea about what is the role of the state as compared to local governments um, are probably really applicable in other states as well. And with that, I'll turn it back over and look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, as a relatively new California resident, I've just been so encouraged by the extent to which California is leading on action around adaptation and especially around sea level rise. It's, you know, even given all the challenges and constraints you lay out, it's 
yeah, it's, it's very exciting to see all the work that you're doing. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, all right, I see uh, one question at least has come in so far. Please keep submitting questions in that Q&A box. You know, we'll see if we have time for them at the end. I think it's possible for our, our presenters to also maybe write back to some of those as text too if we don't get to them. So um, thank you so much also for, for being so succinct with your presentation. Hopefully we will have time for questions. Um, our next speaker is Courtney Humphreys. Courtney is a PhD candidate in environmental sciences at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Courtney, take it away. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, um, thanks very much. It's, I'm really excited to be here today um, sharing a screen with um, some amazing speakers. Um, so I'm a um, PhD candidate um, at University of Massachusetts, Boston. I've also been a, um, a longtime journalist writing about um, science and urban planning issues. Um, and I'm here to talk about some um, ongoing research I'm conducting as part of my dissertation on um, the role that law and laws and policies play in the ability of urban areas to adapt to climate change. Um, and I'm focusing on um, a case study of um, sea level rise in Boston. Um, and, uh, you know, just like cities today are dealing with um, legacy infrastructure um, that isn't necessarily adapted to the current climate, we also inherit a regulatory infrastructure that can be helpful or maladaptive in responding to new challenges. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Boston's um, history and waterfront context and its current climate adaptation planning for sea level rise. And then some questions I'm asking about the use of fill, of intertidal fill for shoreline adaptation and um, the impact of waterfront laws and regulations on the planning design and implementation of um, climate adaptation projects. So as we know, um, global sea levels could um, rise um, several feet this century, um, and that could pose an existential threat to a lot of coastal cities, not just in terms of the land that would actually be subject to flooding, but just in terms of their overall um, economic health and the regional economies that they support. In Boston, um, it has been and is projected to experience above average sea level rise. Um, under um, high emission scenarios, you know, it could be seven or more feet by the end of the century. The city is planning for um, uh, 40 inches of sea level rise by about the 2070s. And at that level, um, one fifth of the area of land in the city could be in the 1% chance floodplain by late in the century. And about 5% of the land could actually be subject to regular um, tidal flooding. And, um, you know, one of the things we see is that in many places, um, urbanized areas, um, the history of decision making about infrastructure, about land use and about urban development really shapes the, um, the, the risk that they face um, with climate and the, the climate impacts that they face. And we definitely see this in Boston um, in the centuries long practice of um, creating new land around the waterfront. Um, this is something lots of uh, waterfront cities have done, is filling in um, the shallow areas around, um, around the land to create new land. But uh, Boston's a somewhat extreme example in that it created all, over 5,000 acres of new land over its history. Some of the most um, developed um, parts of the city and most dense, densely developed parts of the city are, are built on fill. And on, and on the left, you can see there's a map showing this. Um, the dark green shows the original landform of Boston, um, and the light green shows all the areas of fill that were added around it, so it's quite significant. Um, and on the right, you can see this is a map um, of flood model um, showing the 1% chance storm floodplain under sea level rise levels predicted in 2050 in darker blue and 2070 in lighter blue. And just you know, many people in the city have been struck by the similarities between these, these images um, that just so many of the places um, that were created land are now going to be the areas most at risk of flooding in the future. Um, so not only did Boston build a floodplain, but it's been actively redeveloping it um, 
there's been a lot of waterfront redevelopment. Um, the images here show the, the Seaport District, which is a striking example where an entire new neighborhood has been, has been built on former industrial land. Um, and you know, over the past 30 years, and even just the past five to 10 years, a lot of these buildings have been built. And there's a lot of areas um, in the metro area that are um, including growth areas identified in the city's own master plan for 2030 that are in f a future floodplain. And it's important to note that the city gets a lot of um, revenue from property taxes and particularly from new development. So there's, um, and because the city's growing, uh, the population's growing, the economy's been growing, there's just, um, it's kind of locked into this pattern of um, continuing to develop the waterfront. So given that, it's not surprising that a lot of the conversations about climate adaptation in the city have not focused on managed retreat or uh, moving away from the waterfront, but have focused on how to protect the waterfront. Um, and the city is focused on um, shoreline-based solutions, uh, has, has engaged in a pretty, uh, pretty robust planning process, um, looking at vulnerable neighborhoods um, and planning some potential features that could be um, stitched together all around the waterfront to help to provide flood protection, including raised walkways, berms, um, possibly some seawalls, um, parkland. And if you look at the, the image on the bottom shows is from the mayor's um, resilient Boston Harbor vision, which really focuses on green space uh, and green infrastructure as um, protective flood features. And um, it doesn't, uh, you, when you look closely, you see that some of this land is already parkland, but a lot of it is built um, all the way up to the waterfront. And so to create green space would require um, taking away something that's already there or building out into the water in some way. So um, like other um, cities, Boston put aside its land filling practices um, decades ago with the advent of environmental laws and um, just a growing awareness of the terrible ecological impacts of, um, of uh, filling over salt marshes and other intertidal habitats. Um, and in Boston, there's also, Regulation. There are also um, restrictions on fill. Were also part of regulations designed to protect the public trust in the shoreline and to balance um, public interests with private development. But recently, there's been several reports from different groups um, raising the question of of um, the need for to to use intertidal fill as part of the city's climate adaptation plans and um, the need to, to do some regulatory reform um, to allow that. Um, and the, the shoreline um, is, because it's both land and water, it's governed by um, a complex set of um, federal, state, and local regulations and permitting processes. Um, and they're designed to protect several values, such as um, public access to the shoreline, um, navigation and maritime commerce, um, wetland resources, habitat, water quality, um, things like that. And um, this table focuses on the ones that are specific to fill, but there's also others that just relate generally to coastal management or to de development. And depending on the size, location, and scope of a project, you might need um, a lengthy permitting process um, with several agencies uh, weighing in on a project. Um, and requiring multiple um, permits or licenses. So the laws don't ban fill entirely, but they make it very prohibitive um, um, to do so. Um, and so I've been um, looking at, uh, I'm interested in how the laws, policies, and, the, and permitting processes around fill shape or constrain climate adaptation in Boston. And I've been conducting interviews with waterfront stakeholders, um, including um, uh, waterfront advocacy groups, um, designers, engineers, um, legal consultants, developers, and regulators um, about to understand how they view the use of fill for climate adaptation. And do these views suggest a framework for future policy discussions about climate adaptation and fill along the shoreline? 
Um, and it's clear that regulations are, shape, are shaping waterfront adaptation projects. Um, just in terms of, of the projects that are that are moving forward, in terms of how they're designed, where the, where they are. Um, and one thing that's important is that most regulations do not yet consider future sea level rise and resiliency goals. So when um, regulators are evaluating a project, it's not really it's not usually part of their mandate to to weigh those goals against against the others that they're that they're mandated to protect. Um, and there's a disconnect between the kinds of preliminary plans and visions that people would would um, imagine for for Boston's waterfront and the actual permittable projects that are to, uh, that are being implemented or are coming coming farther along in the planning process. And I found that the the length of the permitting process and just the history and professional culture around Phil are important constraints. Um, this is a quote from a developer that Phil is a four letter word in Boston Harbor. So there's a sense that um, there's a real reluctance to um, to take a risk on on doing something that um, might uh, that regulators might not approve. Um, I have found though that there's a there's an overall consensus that there needs to be some regulatory flexibility for allowing fill and the shoreline. Um, and but there's different arguments. Excuse me. <laughs> there's different arguments for doing so. Um, there's an ecological argument, which is the strongest one that has the most consensus around it. And, and that is that people really want to see a greener shoreline, a shoreline in Boston Harbor. Um, the image um, I'm showing here is a, a residential, res residential project in East Boston um, that created a small living shoreline um, in addition to some other features around the shoreline and some other resilience features of the project. And that's been... Um, gotten a lot of attention, excuse me, <laughs> gotten a lot of attention and awards recently. Um, there's also a social argument for allowing Phil, and that is that um, Boston has recently, um, has well, over the past few decades, has created a public harbor walk around um, much of Boston's inner harbor. And um, that um, there's, you know, the idea of being able to use some fill to either expand the Harbor Walk or create some public space is also an attractive one. And of course, as always, there's an economic argument for fill, um, which is why it was used in the past, which is that you do, um, you can maximize the developable land. And one of the key issues with doing climate adaptation is, of course, how to finance it. And so if there was more flexibility for developers to um, actually fill out into the shore, it could help um, create a financial incentive for doing flood control projects. But as you can see, you know, these different arguments kind of um, lend themselves to different visions of what the, sh what, um, the shoreline should be. So, an, you know, the ecological argument of allow using a little bit of fill to make a living shoreline is very different from the more extreme example I'm giving of actually creating land um, to help fund um, climate adaptation. So that suggests there's some tensions about the proper scope and use of fill and how to balance, how to um, make regulations more flexible while still protecting all of these things that the regulations are designed to protect, like navigation and shipping, environmental protections, um, public space and access, and then I think the more recent emphasis on equity, equity, especially in a city that's been gentrifying really rapidly, um, how to, um, <coughs> excuse me, do adaptation projects more equitably, and also how to open up um, the regulations. There's some concern that opening up regulations to, um, um, to these discussions would disrupt the balance of interests and possibly give developers more control over the state of the waterfront. So I think it's important that regulations um, may need to consider context that urban waterfronts and non-urban waterfronts might have different um, adaptation needs that should be captured in the regulations. Um, Nature-based solutions are helping to align diverse stakeholders around shoreline adaptation. And so um, some kind of projects that focus on greening the shoreline could really be a good test for regulatory flexibility. 
And having more regular, regulatory flexibility for fuel could help cities provide beneficial flood protection, but also perpetuate these ongoing development patterns of continuing to develop in low-lying areas along the coast, and which could potentially put more people in harm's way and ultimately be somewhat maladaptive. So thank you very much. Um, I welcome the discussion that follows. Thank you so much, Courtney. As someone who studies retreat, um, I really appreciate the sort of fill perspective, the attack by building further out into the water versus retreat, and especially the kind of nuance you've, you've brought to that, whereas I just tend to think of it all lumped together. It's really helpful to kind of see you talk through the many different implications sort of within that four-letter word. Um, so that that was fascinating. And also this gap between, you know, kind of the planning and implementation that I think also came through in Rachel's presentation and so much of kind of the mess and challenge that adheres in that in that space. And I know in our in our audience, I can see we have some some people from Rebuild by Design, the very innovative post Sandy planning process in New York that I think has, you know, confronted many of these issues as well. So so uh, something that we'll continue to think about and talk through. Let me now turn the stage over to our third presenter, um, Rob Moore. Rob is the director of the Water and Climate Team at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, Rob, take it away. Thanks, Liz. So uh, I work for the small team at the Natural Resources Defense Council that's focused entirely on uh, climate adaptation issues, particularly as they relate to flooding and sea level rise. We also, in the context of that work, end up kind of looking at federal disaster policies uh, in a more in a more general way as well. And we became really issue interested in this whole issue of um, how are we going to adapt as a nation to um, the situation of sea level rise in particular, but also increasing frequency and incidence of inland flooding as well. And we started to realize pretty quickly, when you look at, at the various federal programs that are out there, whether it's the National Flood Insurance Program or the Hazard Mitigation um, Programs funded under the Stafford Act, that uh, they may not be capable of scaling up to the challenges that we are facing as a result of, of climate change now. And without new approaches, you know, the, the, the entire concept of management, managed retreat may, may not be manageable. So um, one, of the, one of the things that's really a, a precursor for any type of managed retreat effort is the ability to offer uh, fair and equitable buyouts of private property that enable people who need a buyout to re relocate to a safer location. Um, you know, that with, without, without that mechanism, uh, you don't have uh, the concept of of managed, nor do you have the concept of retreat. Um, so we, we started looking more carefully at what are the buyout efforts that are underway in the United States. And there's there, there's a huge number of, of federal, state, and local agencies that are directly financing these types of acquisitions. Um, but the agency that really does more than, far more than any other agency is the Federal Emergency Management Agency. So we, we've been taking a really close look at their programs, and I want to share with you today some of the results of some of the research we've been doing and some ideas we have for how to offer some new pathways for securing a buyout uh, as a part of a more effective managed retreat strategy. So if you look at um, projected populations impacted just by sea level rise, this is a paper from Nature Climate Change a few years ago that Matt Hauer did. Um, you can really you really see the the human implications of sea level rise. You know, we can talk about the feet of sea level rise, but it's hard to translate that into a population. So this this graph shows that. So the bottom line is three feet of sea level rise would would have directly inundated high tide about 4.2 million uh, Americans' homes, um, and with six feet of sea level rise, about 13.1 million uh, people's homes would be would be inundated. That's not taking into account 
um, storm surge that's not taking into account, tidal flooding, and this has, says nothing about uh, the increasing incidence of inland flooding that we're seeing across the United States. So this is just a portion of the potential migration challenge that the nation can be facing in the coming decades. So then when you look at how many buyouts has over its history. So sent between 1989 and 2017, FEMA's conducted a little over 43,000 uh, buyouts that they financed. Most of those have been done using post-disaster funding, what's known as the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. Those dollars actually are not authorized until a federal disaster declaration is made. And the FEMA has paid out uh, on a median amount of $54,000 for each of the properties that it's helped acquire. And that's on a, with a 75, 25% cost share with state and local governments. And what we found in looking at these projects is that uh, one of the critical factors that we've got to figure out how to fix is that these these projects take an enormous amount of time to conduct, over five years, which is a long time to ask somebody to wait whose home has just flooded and is at a pretty heightened risk of flooding again. So if you just you know scale that up over the next 90 years, I mean, if we've done 43,000 buyouts over 30 years, we go out three more 30-year periods you know, FEMA's, FEMA's programs uh, would be capable of purchasing, helping purchase another 130,000 homes, which is pretty far short of the millions of people uh, that are projected to lose their homes just from sea level. Of sea level rise. So clearly, um, we, we have some issues that we need to resolve for these programs to be able to, to really meet the need uh, that we're looking at in the future. So if you look over time, um, even that 43,000 number might even be a little generous. Um, apologies for the numbers being so small, but this is basically a time, this is just a time series starting in 1989 and going through 2017. And you can see immediately that the most buyouts FEMA ever financed, over 8,000 in 1993 after the 500 year flood on the Mississippi River. And it's never even come close to financing that many uh, in any other given year. In fact, arguably, you could say that we're we're doing uh, the trend uh, is not going up. It's it's going down, if anything. So so we have a real challenge ahead of us. So we we've been wondering why why are buyouts um, not being offered more frequently, and and why aren't more people participating in them? And we really think it comes down one of the critical factors beyond funding really gets down to just the, the time involved uh, for a person to try and make it through this process. So we issued a report last year called Going Under um, that really looked in depth at, at these projects. Um, what we found is uh, these buyouts have occurred in 49 of the 50 states. Uh, Hawaii is the only state that has never had a FEMA financed buyout uh, conducted within its boundaries. But when you look at the time it takes to, to move these projects along, this is a graph of uh, the, the number of projects and how long it took them uh, simply to get approved following a federal disaster declaration. And you can see uh, one to two years is pretty much the typical time after a federal flood disaster is declared before a buyout project, uh, before the funding is even proved, approved by FEMA to conduct a buyout project. So that's that's a pretty long time for anybody to have to endure uh, wondering if they're going to get a buyout. Even after a project is approved, uh, e more years can go by before a, a buyout is actually completed and uh, all the buyouts that are part of a project in totality are wrapped up and in fact, um, uh, it can be a, a pretty frustrating process. And when you add those two graphs together, you find that you know, the median project takes in excess of five years to complete. And these are just for uh, transactions that occur in the aftermath of a federal disaster declaration. Although those are by far the vast majority of buyouts that FEMA finances. So 
a lot of times, if you look on FEMA's website or a lot of other papers that have been done on buyouts, they, they lay out kind of the basic process for how these, these transactions occur. And it, it looks like a simple four-step process uh, in the flow chart that you'll see in FEMA guidance. It's like FEMA approves disaster declaration, FEMA approves funding, state, state applies for funding, owner offered buyout. And it, it looks like, oh, four steps, that's not so hard. But this is what the process actually looks like. Um, you know, it starts after uh, a flood happens, and then um, uh, it can be uh, up to a year before hazard mitigation funding is even made available or uh, that a state even applies for this funding. And, and then it becomes a pretty long odyssey that can spread out over years before a homeowner actually sees their home purchased and the project is closed out because paperwork has to move from FEMA to the state to the local government, to the homeowner, and then back up that chain two or three more times uh, before a project ultimately is concluded. Uh, and, and a delay by any one of those parties, uh, you know, propagates through the whole chain of circumstances around securing a buyer. But if you look at the, just the last two lines, this is what a homeowner experiences. So a homeowner uh, has their house flood if they have flood insurance, they file a damage claim and they get that process within a few months. Uh, the NFIP pays the claim out and then they probably start rebuilding. And then about a year and a half later, uh, the local government or state government knocks on their door and says, hey, have you thought about getting a buyout for your uh, home that's flooded multiple times? And the person says, well, you know, Maybe I would have been a few months ago before I rebuilt again, but now I'm not. Or the person says, no, I'm, I'm not interested in a buyout. You know, I, I just got done rebuilding. Or um, maybe they say, yeah, I, I am interested in a buyout. That sounds like a great idea. And for those people, you know, two or more years could easily go by before that government, uh, come, the local government comes back and says, hey, we got the funding we're ready to buy your house. And that puts a homeowner in an extremely awkward situation. You know, they're wondering, do I rebuild? Do I not rebuild? Am I going to get a buyout? Am I not going to get a buyout? Um, do you continue to even invest money in your house? You know, if your furnace breaks, do you spend money on a new furnace? Because FEMA is not giving you money for your existing house plus the new furnace. If your roof starts to leak, do you you fix it and put a new roof on because you're not get, that's money that you're not going to get back. Um, if you don't make those investments, continuing investments in your house and your buyout is not approved, um, now you've really put yourself in an even deeper hole. So this this whole convoluted process that we currently employ for affecting buyout, um, it takes too long and it puts people in a, in a really, really bad situation that nobody would ever want to be in unless you were truly desperate, I think, um, uh, to get out. And, and obviously a lot of people uh, are, but a lot of people actually don't even make it through this process. Uh, in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey, before Harvey hit, there were about a thousand people on a waiting list for a, a buyout. Um, after Harvey hit, within months, there were, I think another three to 4,000 people that had applied for a buyout. And over time, what happened is people got tired of waiting and they began selling their homes to real estate speculators who promptly flipped them back uh, by selling them or fixed them up and rented them to the next unsuspecting renter uh, or sold them to the next unsus unsuspecting homeowner. Uh, and, and the opportunity was lost to actually purchase those properties because the process drags on so long. So one of the things NRDC has been working on and have started talking with a few local governments and even started talking to FEMA about a little bit is, is creating a new paradigm for how these, these acquisitions could be um, um, financed and, uh, and, and executed. And it really is a concept of approaching people before the next flood and pre-approving them for a buyout and effectively guaranteeing them a buyout as a benefit of their flood insurance coverage. So all of those steps that take years to get through where the paperwork is just moving from local state to federal government's desks and then back down the chain and back up again could all be done before a flood. Uh, a minimum price could be agreed upon for a property. 
um, uh, a buyout would be triggered either at the homeowner's discretion or uh, when the house passes a certain threshold of uh, monetary damage to the home, it would be triggered automatically. And there would be no uncertainty for the homeowner. They would be able to uh, know that they are going to immediately get assistance to be able to relocate. They would even be able to stay in the house uh, until either they decide they want to move or the home actually reaches that threshold of damage that automatically triggers a buyout. So this, this is a, an approach that we think uh, could really have some merit. Uh, it's not a silver bullet. It's not going to uh, magically make managed retreat uh, a, a possibility that's, that's within our grasp, but it would give us one more pathway. It would give people one more pathway to pursue um, when they know that they, they need to move to higher ground. And this wouldn't be something that would be available to everybody everywhere. There would clearly have to be some limitations. That, you know, for this to be an equitable solution, this can't be something that we're offering to uh, beachfront mansions uh, or second homeowners um, or you know the, the more affluent members of society. And you know, we really think this is something that could be focused more on low and middle income property owners, uh, perhaps properties that are below the maximum amount of insurance you can even buy through the National Flood Insurance Program, uh, which is about $250,000 on, um, on the structure itself. And I think it would be something where the FEMA administrator would have to find that it's in the financial best interest of the flood insurance program to pursue this. Like they, they, they would say, look, we know this home is going to flood over and over and over again, and we're going to pay out more in damage claims than the house is worth. And if the homeowner wants to move, why, why should we uh, perpetuate a cycle of flood, rebuild, repeat? Um, and you can even target, target this solution geographically as well. But you know, in doing this, you know, FEMA would be giving a property owner the ability to stay in a home in a near term. Um, we also think people who sign up for this should also perhaps get a reduced rate on their flood insurance premiums. So it actually would reduce their cost of maintaining coverage until the buyout actually occurs. Um, it could even be transferable. So the person might even have the ability to sell the property and this um, guaranteed buyout would transfer to the next owner, it would ride with the property. And it would eliminate a lot of the uncertainty that homeowners currently have to endure uh, when they try to secure a buyout that allows them to move somewhere safer. And in exchange, FEMA and the nation as a whole would get a long-term uh, guaranteed reduction in flood damages and um, financially could even benefit the, the National Flood Insurance Program in the long run. So, you know, this the, the I think, um, I think as, as the two previous speakers uh, mentioned as well, you know, we need a lot of new approaches. Uh, this is one, one mechanism that NRDC has been thinking about, um, but, but clearly the, the scale of the problems we're facing due to flooding and sea level rise uh, necessitate that uh, we, we come up with some new and improved ways of affecting buyouts. Thank you. Rob, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate you offering some solutions here and some ideas for, for ways to break that, that cycle that you mentioned and also for drawing out this really vexing challenge of scale. You know, it's it's so mind boggling, especially when you bring in the inland as well as the the coastal flooding, you know, even just thinking around that one hazard. But then, you know, it seems both impractical to scale up some of these approaches and it seems wildly impractical to not do it too and to just let retreat be unmanaged. And so I think, you know, you're working at this very fraught interface and I appreciate you giving us, uh, you know, some insight into that and also this challenge of planning preemptively to adapt instead of waiting for after after a disaster. And that's that's a really tough thing to do too, especially thinking about, you know, the lived experience of it that you that you highlight. So now let me turn to our esteemed discussant, Kristen Marcel, um, who's going to offer her comments and questions, I think. Kristen's the director of the Cly Migration Network. Uh, that's a network devoted to tackling the fraught questions of when and how communities should consider retreat or relocation in response to climate change. So, so following on really nicely from Rob's presentation. Uh, Kristen, over to you. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to be joining this panel today. And I've so enjoyed 
hearing all of these presentations, I wrote down a huge list of questions, but uh, I can't get to all of them. So I'm going to have to pick a few. I'm going to start first uh, with Rachel's. Uh, I have a, I wanted to just comment a little on your presentation and ask you a couple of questions. Um, I, my prior life before I entered this position, uh, I was in uh, working in New York State as a contractor uh, to the New York State Devar Department of Environmental Con Conservation, and we struggled every day with the capacity challenges that uh, communities were facing in trying to address um, primarily flooding, but also heat and drought. Um, I really like the idea of trying to think creatively about how to engage communities, especially when it, you know, something like sea level rise seems so far away to many communities. Uh, I recall a, a colleague of mine, Sarah Newkirk, uh, liken it, likening it to being attacked by a giant snail, and that has never left me. Um, but it makes it really challenging to engage communities. Uh, on these issues, especially this year, as you said, with the multiple challenges that they're facing. So I wanted to know from you, um, what are some of the more creative ideas that have been tossed around for creating these regional collaborative dialogues? I'm wondering if there's an opportunity uh, for partners that are engaging in this conference today to help uh, to get the word out. I know you said the State Department, you know, could do an outreach campaign, but maybe there's something that could be done also collaboratively uh, at the regional scale uh, from an outreach perspective and engagement perspective. Um, and then also wondering, and I'm sorry, this is a three-part question, I'm kind of cheating, um, about whether there are opportunities to think collectively about the fire risk and the flood risk as you begin to engage uh, and build, uh, as the state could begin to engage and build these, these regional networks. Great, thanks so much for those questions. Um, yeah, well, so we're lucky here in California, we do have kind of a backbone of regional collaboratives that has been set up just from the grassroots level that we can build upon. Um, there's an alliance, the acronym is ARCA, Alliance of Regional Climate Collaborative Association. <laughs> um, so, so different regions have started kind of putting this together, but it's very grassroots um, and hasn't been, hasn't received much state funding. So at least we have something we can build on. It's more robust in some areas than others uh, and differing levels of participation. But I think um, acknowledging those capacity limitations that individual government, local governments have, the only way we're gonna get through this is by not leaving each city out there by themselves to recreate the wheel and make it up by themselves. It, we, it just is not going to work. It's not going to work because the water is going to come and impact neighboring communities regardless of their levels of preparation. Um, and also, we just don't have the resources to be able to do it uh, individually, group by group. So. Uh, that's why working together is just is going to be not only make sense, but also be essential. So I think building off of those climate collaboratives that we have, hopefully local governments will have incentives to, to opt in because um, of shared resources and shared ideas and shared decision making. Um, but certainly the state can help by putting some dollars on the table to, to help with that. Um, so I think that that's, that that's one important model. Um, so your second question was, you threw a, a bunch of them at me. At I did. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> that's okay. I'm um, I was looking, what it was. I, yeah, sure. So the next one uh, was about how partners could be involved or be helpful. I know there are a lot of people from California in this conference today. Yeah, I mean, I would say starting to build on on those regional networks. I mean, it's not a perfect system. Some areas of the state don't have them. Oh, and your question about what about fire and other climate challenges? 
Yeah, you know, that was really interesting in the research that we did for this report. Sometimes we would ask, well, if the state is going to put some money on the table to develop a climate uh, adaptation plan or a coastal adaptation plan, should we start with just coastal? so that it's sort of a tangible thing, or should it be kind of climate challenges writ large? And it was really interesting, we got very different answers. Some communities said, yeah, why would we silo for just sea level rise? We've got the ocean coming in our front and the fire coming in our back. We can't, we can't ignore one for the other. We, it has to be uh, kind of a climate plan uh, in, incorporating all of the challenges. Whereas other jurisdictions said, no, whoa, if it's climate, if it's full climate, that's way too overwhelming. We can't even handle that. We have to start with a chewable bite of the apple and really um, practice with one climate challenge and then learn use those lessons for others. So I think that really highlights how important it is that this comes at the local level, that the state provides support, um, resources, models, but we can't have a one-size-fits-all that we force from the state level down to um, locals because not only are they dealing with different challenges across a diverse state like California, but just the preferences at the local level and capacity at the local level are, are really varied. Wonderful, thank you so much. I'm gonna move on now to Courtney. I have a few questions for you. So again, in my past life working uh, for New York, um, we were drafting policy guidance that was designed to help communities and state staff um, think about uh, natural shoreline solutions. We were dealing with a lot of the same questions that you raised in your research. And um, I'm curious to know, one of the things that really caught my ear as you were speaking um, was that the ecological uh, argument for creating, you know, considering fill in our shoreline areas was one of the strongest of the three, economic, social, and ecological. Um, and, you know, these regulations are designed primarily to protect the ecological value of our shoreline areas uh, and the public trust. And so I was curious to know, and, you know, I've been away from that work now for at least, you know, six months. I'm curious to know if there's new information um, that is compelling uh, on the ecological value of uh, the fill in those areas. It's something that, again, like I said, we struggled with because it was difficult to compare apples to apples with different shoreline treatments. So maybe you could talk a little bit about what you know what you saw in terms of compelling ecological arguments for this, and then whether you. This is my second piece of this question, and I'm happy to repeat it um, again later. You know, what ways do you think might be useful for folks? Uh, working in the public sector and those who are working in the private and nonprofit sector, um, what might be useful ways of reframing this conversation that might allow for um, less headbutting in this space and more thinking uh, about how to approach it uh, collaboratively? Um, great. Those are really good questions. Um, so for the, um, <clears throat> the ecological arguments, I think, um, um, I mean, I think there's, you know, there's been a growing body of research about, um, about these, you know, nature-based solutions and, and things. I think there is still a question about how, how beneficial they are, especially in, in an urban environment, like, how feasible they are. Um, and, you know, I know even in, in the image I showed of the very small living shoreline in Boston, um, you know, they had, they had some trouble getting it going, you know, uh, getting, getting like planting salt marsh plants in, in an urbanized waterfront. And, uh, there was another one in, in another location that, um, you know, apparently all the all the geese came along and ate up all the seeds, and, and you know, so there's there's sort of fe there's a feasibility issues. That I I I still have I still have questions about how I mean, even though it, it sounds wonderful and it looks wonderful to and it, to think about having a greener shoreline in Boston, um, I also have questions about what's going to really work. Um, there's also there are also questions about 
how um, you know some of those things they do um, impact wave you know waves they they do slow you know waves down but they won't necessarily do anything about sea level rise itself and may need to be protected against sea level rise you know because that there are also marshes also can be lost you know as the, as sea levels rise so I think um, I think there are some really good questions about um, are we letting uh, our ideas about wanting to have greener shores guide our design choices you know and, and those are those going to be the most effective flood solutions you know so i overall i, I i'm very supportive of the idea and I, and I think it's um i i think i think there is growing evidence for it but i also think um in terms of context there's a lot of details you know that that need to be worked out and and um and it needs to be really appropriate to the site um and not every you know some boston harbor is fortunate in that it's it's not really a high velocity area so that helps you know but there are other urban areas where there's just too much um <clears throat> it's a little too high velocity to sort of build a salt marsh there you know so um yeah so that, that's how i'd answer that i think i think that the um the evidence is building but it's it's going to be very context specific um and then um oh no now i've forgotten the other one that's okay <laughs> it's okay <laughs> The second one was, do you have any creative ideas for how to reframe the conversation mm -hmm. and to make it feel more collaborative? I feel like it's there's a lot of kind of headbutting going on and and yeah. not kind of progress in the discussion. Yeah, and I, I you know I don't know that I've I've come to um, you know a final state of that, but I am that's something I am thinking about. Um, I'm I'm also interested. You know, my research actually combines um, the historical research with, um, you know, more of this policy, current policy and environmental issues. So I'm, I'm really interested in Boston and thinking about this history of, um, of land building and, and kind of learning from that and having that help to, to guide some of the discussions. Because, I, you know, we obviously have a history of, of changing the waterfront and how do we do that in a way that's um, that's ethical that doesn't re re redo some of the past damage that was done, um, but also acknowledges that that Boston shoreline is is a creation. You know, it's not a um, it, it's not a uh, pristine environment. You know, so it, I, I I'm sort of agnostic to whether we use fill or not, but I think that that how we do it. Um, and the reasons we do it are, are really important. And so I think um, framing it within within that history and within the sort of local context is important. Wonderful, thank you so much. Now, Rob, I have some questions for you. First, you know, thank you so much for your presentation. I thought the statistics that you shared were absolutely staggering. I mean, to imagine you know, First Street has Foundation has done analyses recently that show 14.6 million properties in the 100-year floodplain. And to imagine that we could only remedy 130,000 of those by 2110 is just, you know, I almost don't know what to do with those numbers. <laughs> so um, it's really helpful to, to do have. something different. That's what we do. That's one way. <laughs> right, but what? But radically different. <laughs> so, you know, it's interesting to see that framing. And then I feel like email traffic in my own personal inbox recently, following the article by Christopher Flavel, the New York Times, that was laying out how there were these massive policy shifts happening and funding shifts happening. And I just wanted to hear your perspective. You know, are you excited? by the the new FEMA brick funding and the HUD funding and you know the the coverage of how the Army Corps is making decisions around um, buyouts and relocation are those things feeling like wow we are really moving in the right direction or are you feeling like those are kind of a drop in the bucket um, compared to what's really needed so that's question one and again I'm happy to repeat question two question two you know I think it's really interesting the way that you reframed um, the kind of interaction between the government uh, and the client, if you assume the client being the property owner, 
uh, if you're thinking about kind of a business model relationship um, in in what you proposed, what do you th see as kind of the big challenges to to making that a reality? And how could partners or folks in this room be helpful in in helping to to shift that dialogue? Yeah. So I think on the second question. Um, um, FEMA recognizes the problem. They, they, they would be, um, uh, I think they would be very quick to admit. In fact, they have pretty much said, yeah, you know, buyouts take too long. Our process takes too long. It's not entirely our fault, but the way, the way Congress has said we have to do these projects, um, it's, it's not meeting our goals. And there's a recent GAO report that came out um, actually, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a Department of Homeland Security Inspector General report. Oh, and a GAO report that came out a month before, uh, pointing out the inadequacies of these programs. And in FEMA's response, uh, they basically said, yeah, you're right. Like, we, we've got real issues um, helping mitigate homes that are already uh, flooding repeatedly and that people actually probably want mitigation assistance. We just released last week uh, an even more sobering uh, tool you can find called Losing Ground that visualizes flood insurance data. And uh, if you look at what FEMA calls severe repetitive loss properties, about the same number of people who see their homes mitigated um, uh, drop out of the flood insurance program completely. So any decrease that we're, um, so the number of severe repetitive loss properties is growing, even though about some number of those is getting mitigated and some people are just giving up and leaving the flood insurance program completely. So we, we lose, their home isn't safer. They've just stopped buying flood insurance. So, you know, the, the true scope of the problem isn't even reflected in our flood insurance data because that reason and many others. So um, I think FEMA is actually increasingly open to hearing about new solutions. We, um, you know, we've had some very encouraging conversations with them. Many other organizations have been have as well. I think you know, for them, I think a lot of it could start with local governments and state governments. You know, they, if, if, you, if you look at FEMA's, if you look at these programs, FEMA has no authority to come to a city and say, you're going to do buyouts and we're going to do them this way and we're going to get them done in this amount of time. They can, they, they simply, they're like a foundation, right? People apply for grants. Um, they, they, they decide if the grant meets its criteria and where it scores relative to other grants. And that's what they fund. And then once they've approved the funding, it's, it's completely up to the grantee to execute the project. So, you know, FEMA can be FEMA's, procedures within its own office can be part of the difficulty, but there's just as many problems in the state and local administration of the funds as well. With all that said, you know, probably the fastest, I think FEMA would say you can get a buyout done through their, through their programs is still about a year. Um, that would be, you know, state of the art, every, everybody moving at the speed of light to get one of these done. So, but I think it really it really needs to start with local conversations and conversations at the state level. You know, local leaders need to know that that there are people that want buyouts and that there's a demand that needs to be met. They need to go and solicit the funds, and they need to be planning. You know, as as uh, as as uh, so many other people in presentations at this conference have emphasized, if you're not thinking ahead to how you're going to solve these problems. The worst time to figure it out is after a disaster has already hit you. Um, so yeah, we need to start thinking about buyouts, not as something we do in the aftermath of a disaster. We need to start thinking about them as uh, actions we can take to avoid uh, the next disaster. On that note, I'm going to jump in here. Uh, because we have reached our time. So thank you so much, Kristen, for your response and your questions. Thanks so much to our panelists. We had some amazing questions in the q and I think some of them were able to be answered in the text box. You know, some others probably 
could not be answered, even if we had a whole nother allotted session time for this panel. But, you know, I just want to flag a couple of the, the points that I think were really important that hopefully conversations can continue around if you want to get in touch with the speakers independently or hopefully at a future Luskin climate event. So questions like the impacts of risk maps and some of these preemptive buyout proposals on, on property values, on housing markets, questions about planning for these receiving communities, places that you know are going to see maybe more population moving into their areas because of sea level rise, you know, planning for the impacts of non-human migration, species migrations, wetlands migration. Um, these really important questions, you know, given our current COVID and associated economic crisis, about the kinds of recovery opportunities that might also have climate adaptation incorporated within them, you know, or be able to kind of tackle both at once. So, you know, a number of really good questions. Thanks so much to everyone for tuning into this session. Again, thank you so much to our, our panelists and our discussant. Uh, up next at 3.15 p.m., let me just plug the next breakout sessions. We have sessions on the social cost of carbon, on adaptation by farmers and anglers, on hazards, housing, and displacement, and on extreme heat and cooling strategies. So I'll let you all make your way to those sessions and thank you again.